So welcome everybody to uh, the Redefining the Work panel, um, a celebration of First Peoples Multicultural Services. And I'm gonna actually start by turning it over to Laura Grabhorn from the uh, Evergreen Longhouse Education and Cultural Center. Thanks, Candy. And thanks everybody for being here and to, for hosting your event here in the Longhouse. Um, we at the Longhouse um, are always pleased to have events like this in here, and this is exactly the kind of um, program that I think should be in here and something that I think that Tina would agree with as well. The Longhouse um, Squigwealt is the Lushootsi name, and it translates roughly to House of Welcome. And it's, as you know, it's the first of its kind built on a US college campus, and it opened its doors in 1995. But it wasn't an easy road to get to this point. In 1972, Mary Ellen Hilaire, who is, was a Lummi elder, began uh, teaching here and thought that Evergreen would be the perfect place for a home that represented Northwest hospitality, but was welcoming to people from all cultures. And at a place like Evergreen, which is on the Eld Inlet and part of the ceded territories of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes, this was the perfect location for a place like Evergreen. And her students were motivated to continue on with that dream. And in 1992, I happened to have a copy of the Capstone Project that Colleen Jolly, Judith Brainerd, and Lawana Bradley wrote about the Longhouse Project and the feasibility study for it. After that, um, it took several more years to gather the funding together for it, and many of the people here on this stage and in this room were a huge part of the project. Uh, tribal elders who are now considered pillars of the log house from the Chehalis tribe, Squaxin Island tribe, Upper Skagit, uh, Skokomish, Macaw, Nisqually, uh, were all a big part of making this dream a reality. And one of the things that we like most about this is that Bruce Miller Subier, uh, who wove and painted the panels that are in the cedar room, said that everybody that comes into the Longhouse becomes part of its story. So thank you very much for being such an important part of our story. And now you're part of a new phase of our story because the Longhouse is the center for the Evergreen State College Indigenous Arts Campus. And if you get a chance, We welcome you to the open house to come and tour the new fiber arts studio next Tuesday night. Um, but if you have a moment after the panel, it'll still be light out. You can go and, and look at the beautiful artwork that's been carved by um, Evergreen alum, uh, Alex McCarty, who is now a faculty member here and a member of the Macaw tribe. He led a team of carvers for the Northwest entrance. The building represents the friendship we have with um, Maori artists in New Zealand. And so you'll see um, Maori art on the eastern entrance. But thank you very much. And I look forward to the panel. And thank you, everybody. Hello and good day. My name is Karma Blackhorn. I use she and her pronouns, and I am the multicultural advisor at First Peoples. Um, and I'm blessed to be in that place after a legacy these good people have helped create. Um, I've been asked to come and speak with you to uh, remind you of how important this moment is and to give thanks to all of you and to all of our speakers and to all of our listeners of being a part of this important moment, of being a part of this reimagining and rediscussing and remembering and re-celebrating the space that we have. Because we have a lot of work to do ahead and so much knowledge to help guide it. Um, so I wanna ask all of you to take care of yourself if you need to stand up and move so that you can be here and take in all you can. 
Uh, keep grabbing food and water. Bathrooms are off to the side. Do what you need to do. Walk and contemplate. But be here and be centered in this, this great knowledge and this great opportunity that we have. Um, I want to give thanks to all of you that are here to help move this work forward after we hear all the, all the great things from these folks. Um, and just to say thank you for supporting First Peoples and all the work that we do. Gendanga people, I was here, Amira. Uh, my name is Amira. Good evening. I just wanted to say maraming salama to the folks that made this event um, happen tonight. Um, so first, I want to give some shout outs to our student staff. So, Sai. And then there's Mayar. There's Sandy. Um, who else is out there? Lisi. RTM, and thank you. <clears throat> I just want to say shout outs to Marami Salama to Candy, Candy Bellman. Um, thank you to Karma. Thank you to the facilities folks who set up the tables and chairs that y'all are sitting on. Thank you to Aramark for catering. And thank you to Electronic Media, because they're recording this and documenting this for us. So, Rami Salamat, and I hope you enjoy. So, Amira is the program coordinator for our Trans and Queer Center, which we are so excited to see growing and flourishing this year. So, thank you, Amira. Okay, my name is Candy Bauman. I'm the interim director for First Peoples Multicultural Advising Services, and I came to Evergreen in 2002 as an undergraduate student. I came to Evergreen when the world seemed like it was politically falling apart, when Evergreen maybe didn't have the best features in the news, when my high school career counselor was like, go any place except Evergreen. But I went to Evergreen, I showed up, and I showed up a week early. I showed up a week early for the Multicultural Scholars Program. And through that program, I was connected with staff and with other students that celebrated a deep and rich history of student-centered support, of connecting with an institution, of not only walking through the doors of education, but holding those doors open for the next generation to come. First Peoples helped me persist at Evergreen. It helped me complete Evergreen. And First Peoples is really the reason why I fell in love with education. So when I arrived here this fall and thought about the context in which I was walking into the doors, it felt a little bit like 2002 in some ways, where there was a little bit of ooh, ooh. And I thought, what better way to celebrate this time of uncertainty, of visioning, of celebration, than to bring back the folks who've done the work over time. To bring back the folks who've been constantly defining what the work is and when necessary, redefining what the work is because that's truly what we do in First Peoples. The work that we do is never static, it's never stopping. The students walking through our doors are never the same and that's an important part of the work and a part of the work that we celebrate. So hopefully tonight we can hear some of the important stories from students, administrators, First People staff about what that work has looked like over time, what the challenges have been, what the rewards have been, and start to celebrate what might come next. So, like any good panel, we have some questions for you. And I've provided the panelists with the questions beforehand, but I just want to remind folks that the questions are a framework for tonight. I've chosen some questions that I think could get the conversation started in certain areas, but if you feel like there are things that we need to add, maybe other questions that we should address, jump on in, right? This is your invitation. So I want to start with our, the first and maybe the easiest question is, please tell us a little bit more about yourself, including the pronouns you use, how you were involved with First Peoples, and what you're up to now. And April, we can start with you. <laughs> And please do use the mics that are in your chair. So, can you hear me? 
Yes? Yes? Okay. So April West Baker, I was a student here back in 1972 um, and then started working here in 1979. Started when, in fact, I think I see her with Dr. Maxine Mims, my very first year here, and made it through my very last year with Dr. Mims and Joy Hardiman. So thank God for Tacoma, which is now Tacoma Campus. Back then, I think it was called the Tacoma Seminar or something, wasn't it? Yeah. Met on Fridays in, in the old Tacoma Community House. I would have never made it through college without the two of you. So thank God for you. Um, I, I think what's really key back in those early days, because it was an office and an effort that was came through student efforts. It really was a decision made by the community and back then it was all a people of color, staff, faculty, and students that had worked together. I think that's what's really key when getting this effort off the ground and I think it has to be going forward. Um, so we'll say more about that but my name is April, graduated in 1979 and uh, she pronouns, she and her pronouns. <laughs> oh, twerking, okay. <laughs> I, thought I didn't, I didn't know how turned on, so. Um, I'm Eugene Fujimoto. Um, I am honored and uh, kind of humbled to be here. I, I, he, him, hers, my pronouns. Um, I mean, he, <laughs> see how nervous I am? You're good. <clears throat> He, him, his are my pronouns. Um, I think in part I'm humbled because uh, I think I've fantasized in some ways over the years about this kind of an event because <clears throat> that my time at Evergreen was so foundational and formative to me uh, in terms of my own growth and development. And I just briefly just publicly I want to acknowledge you know, April, particularly April, Stone, Tomas, <clears throat> Steve Bader, <clears throat> Maxine Joy, Yvonne, a bunch of people out here that I think helped me grow and develop. When I, I thought, think about, back about it, I, this was my first job in higher ed when I started here. I can't remember the exact years because it makes me feel too old, so I try not to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when I started here, <clears throat> um, it, it, I had not worked in higher ed prior to that. And so I always say I really kind of cut my teeth here in many ways and started as the coordinator of the First People's uh, um, Retention um, uh, retention Services, I guess I can't remember what we call it, but peer support. Peer, I'm sorry. Yeah. Peer support. Thank you, peer support. And then uh, after April became the director. So, um, but I didn't know that it was gonna turn into a 30 year career in higher ed and because I then subsequently went to uh, I've been at like six different institutions in Northern California, Bay Area, in Wisconsin, and now in Los Angeles, where I'm at Cal State Fullerton now, as a member of the faculty at uh, Cal State Fullerton in the Ed Leadership Department. So it just has been, um, I, mean, it's been I mostly have done equity and diversity work um, at, on those campuses, at two-year and four-year institutions. It's been very, very rich, very, very difficult, very, very maddening, very exciting made many exciting contacts and 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 I'm uh, really honored to be here to be part of this event look forward to sharing and hearing from my colleagues good evening uh, Ricardo Leiva Puebla um, he him his uh, pronouns um, I um, I'm too as well honored to be asked and to be present it's Quite a treat, I feel like a, a reunion. I said that earlier to a couple of folks. I feel like I'm in a, a reunion uh, gathering here uh, and it feels really, really good. Um, it's uh, really, truly uh, an honor and pleasure. Um, I am uh, currently um, working at Seattle Central College um, over there with uh, some amazing folks as well. Um, as Dean of Student Development and I too really, remember being here and the fun memories that I have and um, working uh, not only on this campus but also the Tacoma campus 
uh, which was a treat once a week to to head up to the hill and, and spend time with a, another amazing group of folks. So um, it's, I'm a little nervous as well, I can tell. Um, so it's really beautiful uh, to be present and we'll, we'll share more as, as the evening goes by. Thanks, Ricardo. Good evening, my name is Holly Joseph. Um, I use she, her pronouns and I came to Evergreen as the director of First Peoples Advising in the fall of 1999. Um, and I remember when Candy landed on our campus in 2002, and yes, those were tumultuous times um, in that way. So I'm still at Evergreen. I currently am serving as the chief budget officer. Um, I was with First Peoples until 2006, and I felt like I could advocate for students of color and for diversity and equity um, from a different place. I jokingly will say that I crossed over to the dark side of finance and administration and have kind of infiltrated in that way, so now my secret is out. Um, but it's always my work within First Peoples and higher education has um, driven what I do. And the work that I do now, I continue to hold students at the center of that because without our students, we have nothing to do um, and no work. And um, it's great to be here. For me, it's a lot of fun. I recognize so many names that I didn't have faces to go with that were the history of First Peoples. Um, and it's wonderful to have you all here and have an opportunity to be on the panel with you this evening. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Ernest Stone Thomas, and my pronouns are he and him, and my noun is educational leader, warrior, and administrator. Um, I um, owe a debt of gratitude to the two people on my right, but before I do that, I wonder if we could just pause for a minute and think about all of those individuals that have gone before us. Uh, the Mary Hilaire, Rudy Martin, all of those individuals that had something to do with laying the foundation, the groundwork for the kind of social justice work that has been done here at the Evergreen State College for and on behalf of First People. So if we could just take a moment to do that. Thank you very much. And let me say and commend uh, Sister Candy and all of her team for putting together this most timely and worthy uh, occasion. Um, how did I get involved with First Peoples? Um, and let me say this, before it was First People, it was Third World, uh, the Third World um, Coalition. And as I said earlier, I have a debt of gratitude to these two individuals here and to April, uh, because they invited me over uh, to the Evergreen State College when there was struggles around what was then called the non-white community. And so the clear people, excuse me, um, the uh, non-white DTF was the document in which students in their struggle at the Evergreen State College moved toward making sure that the dialogue and the action that was needed to deal with welcoming third world people to this campus. Uh, they were the student organizers that did all the work, invited me over, and we had a long discussion about eliminating the name non-white, and we came up with third world coalition. So it used to be the non-white coalition, then it became the Third World Coalition, and that was in about 1974, and in 1975, I was uh, uh, honored to be appointed the first administrator for the director, as the director of the Third World Coalition. Uh, what I do now is I have the fortunate opportunity, uh, or had the fortunate opportunity of coming back as the senior advisor to President Bridges and 
the uh, senior leadership team. And I, before that, uh, or even now, I teach online uh, in a community college leadership program. Uh, good evening. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Candy and her team. I'd like to thank this uh, college community for the opportunity to be here once again. It's been a number of years uh, since I've, I've been here. Uh, my name is Tomas uh, Ibarra, class of 74. Um, Stone made reference to some of those uh, early years and um, the process that we went through um, inviting Stone to enter this uh, community and uh, assume a position of leadership. Well, it was not by accident. Uh, some of us knew Stone from an earlier life. Um, uh, he and I were uh, undergraduates at uh, WSU. And uh, when I left WSU, it was after a couple of years of uh, a lot of activity, a lot of organizing effort, um, and a lot of turmoil on the WSU campus. Uh, when I left, I le went to go to the uh, farm workers movement where uh, I think the two people who probably influenced my life the most, uh, Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, uh, taught me essentially two things. One, how to speak truth to power, and two, that the best ideas are not going to come from policymakers. They are going to come from the everyday people, uh, the everyday people who are supposed to be served by the institutions that uh, we create and that we try to lead. And so that's why uh, when I came back to Washington State to resume my education, I ended up at Evergreen in 1973 and uh, I was fortunate to meet my sisters, Elena and April. And um, together we spoke truth to power. Uh, and that gave birth to uh, this process. Um, I was the first individual employed uh, by the coalition. But that was before it was an administrative position. And that was before uh, it was uh, placed at a different spot in the uh, organizational structure of the college. But what I remember most clearly about that whole experience was the accessibility of uh, the founding president, Charles McCann, and his provost, Ed Cormandy. Uh, and I mean that uh, in every sense of the word. We never found them either unavailable to us or unwilling to listen to us. Uh, and if it wasn't for them and for some of the founding faculty, uh, this might have been a very different story. Uh, so uh, class of 74, I left to uh, go into the community college system, return for a while to direct an upward bound program hosted by uh, Evergreen State College, and then went back to the community college system. I currently work at Yakima Valley College where I am Vice President for Instruction and Student Services. And uh, uh, the thing that attracts me to that whole effort is the opportunity that it presents to me to influence the culture of that college. Uh, that's what I see my job as, as to influence the culture of the college on behalf of the students and the community that we serve. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Elena Perez. Um, I was here when Evergreen opened up in 1971, before there was a campus. Uh, and I can tell you that when Evergreen opened up, nobody lived here. We all started school off campus. And it wasn't until, I think, the beginning of the next year that the campus opened up. And at that time, Red Square was mud, there were a few bricks, but the, the campus was the library building and the lights went out probably a couple times every day. We all uh, lived with flashlights and the uh, uh, lecture hall 
Those were the only two buildings that were here when Evergreen opened up. There was a program, a coordinated studies program called Contemporary American Minorities. All the people of color, regardless of what they requested when they applied, were put into this coordinated studies program, the Contemporary American Minorities Program, which had some good points and some bad points. It necessarily wasn't what people, what everyone had chosen to study, but it, it, it really helped us get to where the students were able to work together and convince, and convince each other and convince the college that the Third World Coalition was necessary that we needed to be able to get together, we needed to be able to work together, we needed to be able to speak in one voice. And um, as Tomas said, uh, we had an advantage in that um, Charles McCann was very supportive. He met with us regularly and he was willing to uh, create a staff position for the director of what was then the Third World Coalition, and Stone was the first full-time director. Um, Tomas was a student coordinator. I followed him when he left. I graduated in 1975. Stone was the first full-time permanent staff member of the coalition. Um, unlike everybody else on the stage, I did not stay in higher education. Um, I took my education that I think I did fairly well. I went to work for the state. I was in PERS 1, which if you haven't, if you're not familiar with the state retirement, PERS 1, once you have 30 years in, you get your pension, no matter how old you are. And so I'm retired. Uh, I have homeschooled my grandkids. I can do what I want to do. So I feel like I got what I needed from my evergreen education, but I really look back on the time that I spent with the people that I met when I first started at Evergreen. And I got to say that when we got together, we were individually meeting. Native Americans met in one classroom, African Americans in another, Mexican Americans in another. We met as a group, but we also met individually. And that really helped us get to where we learned to work together and got to where we could work together to create the Third World Coalition. And we did that originally without any staff. We did that as an organization of students and faculty and staff, because the faculty and staff were there with us as well. They were there to support us, but they recognized that particularly in this community, people needed to be able to work together to get things done. And the coalition was the way that that helped to make things happen. So. Great, thank you. So some of the themes that I heard towards the end were in these early beginning students organizing to bring about this department, which I think is really critical. And my next question is about some of the, the challenges and rewards to institutionalizing that effort. So it sounds like there was this grassroots, really collaborative approach to students getting together with administration and saying there's a need, how are we gonna make this a part of the institution? And then it becomes a part of the institution. I'm wondering what happens next. And this is maybe a question geared towards Elena and Thomas Stone and April, because you were there during that time of transition from the grassroots initiative to the formal department. What did that look like? I'm very interested in what um, Elena and April and Stone can share about that question. When I left in uh, the fall of 74, the um, report from the DTF had been uh, received by the provost, and it wasn't published until sometime shortly after that. And almost immediately on the heels of that, there was a response from the academic deans. And from what I was able to pick up on, about this process uh, remotely, because I was uh, now away from the campus, was that it was a real mixed bag. That DTF report contained 11 general recommendations and 120 specific recommendations, about a third of which were uh, repeated because they were 
applied across all the administrative units of the college. But in essence, what the DTF was saying to the college was, you need to recognize uh, that people of color uh, are a part of this academic community, need to be a part of it, and need to be served by this community. Uh, so all of those recommendations had to do with challenging each of the administrative units to recognize that reality. Uh, in my present work, I find that that is as important today as it ever was back in that day because every academic that I work with, and I supervise nearly 400 faculty at my institution, uh, well-meaning as they are, they're all trained in a discipline. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's an academic or a professional discipline. Each one of them is trained as opposed to educated. And because they're trained in a discipline, that's how they see their world. And everything that they think about, the way that they react to their reality, is through the prism of their relationship to their discipline. And it's only when you give them the opportunity to uh, step outside of that role and question the world around them, do you create an opportunity for them to consider, how does the work that I do uh, affect the people around me that I'm supposed to be serving? Are there any differences? And if there are, what can possibly account for those differences? Uh, that's the kind of work that uh, I do today, but it was the kind of work that this institution badly needed back in that day. Uh, I, d I know when I came onto campus, it was almost an exclusively white institution, and uh, the professors were specifically trying to either track us into uh, particular academic programs or deny us access to their programs. I know I personally had to stand up to an economics instructor and insist that I would be admitted to the economics course, uh, that I, the economics um, uh, coordinated studies program that I studied in. Uh, but not every student knows how to do that. Not every student knows how to stand up to a professor and insist on the right to be served. Uh, so when I look back on this today, um, what I'm aware of is that in their initial report, the academic deans expressed a lot of frustration uh, about the difficulty of moving forward those DTF recommendations. And part of their frustration stemmed from the reality of what was confronting them. All of their colleagues in the faculty uh, were from their academic discipline. And they were attracted to this institution for its uh, unique mission, but they still related to the world through their academic discipline. And so, as a result, they could either ignore or slow walk recommendations, and they could easily make it difficult for any of them to be realized. And so, that was what I initially heard, and I'm curious what else might have transpired in those couple of years after I left. The, um, when, I, when I came as the director, a lot of work had been done to develop the recommendations, et cetera. My responsibility was to, in fact, use the results of the DTF to strategically develop a plan in which the Third World Coalition would monitor the progress. Um, one of the things, and Elena talks about it, one of the things that attracted me to the position was the opportunity to continue the work around coalition building. And Tomas talks about it, I talked about it. At Washington State, we built a coalition. And we, and I learned from that particular process that everything or anything was possible at or in higher education if, in fact, you struggle together as a coalition to deal with some of the issues that were manifested in systemic kinds of inequities. We call it that now, but it's basically institutional racism. So when I got to the Evergreen State College, you asked what were the challenges, and Tomas pointed out uh, some of the issues around dealing with how do you infuse in a thematic way 
the scholarship of people of color? Mm -hmm. And how do you deal with the systemic or the institutional systemic inequities that exist not only in the curriculum, but it also existed in the support services that were necessary to help students navigate and negotiate the institution. Um, academic advising uh, was minimal. Uh, students, that, uh, students of color that came to the institution needed the kind of support, i.e. through orientation programs. Uh, the assumption that was made with regards to uh, Evergreen in terms of the admissions process uh, was that one could come to the Evergreen State College and succeed without the support that was necessary through the transmission of cultural capital First generation students were having a very difficult time dealing with negotiating and navigating um, everything. I mean, to the point where um, student activities was, in essence, had a blind eye to student organizations. And so we had to deal with how do you develop the kind of process that allocates resources to students of color who in fact have paid SNA fees. Those kinds of things were some of the challenges. And, and, and needless to say, Evergreen was not immune from the kind of attitudes, the narrow-minded ethnocentrism that existed in terms of uh, the society in which we live. The fair weather liberalism that says, hey, we welcome you to the Evergreen State College, but you're on your own when you get here. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of attitude that says, uh, a privileged attitude that says, well, you're here, you're here, but it's not my responsibility if you succeed. Those were the kinds of challenges that I observed coming to the Evergreen State College. And what we did as a community was to look at ways in which, first of all, we developed the kind of support that was necessary for students to, in fact, feel comfortable, and not only students to feel comfortable, but for also for the faculty and staff to feel comfortable. Um, when you're in an environment that does not necessarily feel welcoming, one has to figure out ways in which you maintain the kind of mental health in systemic inequities or an environment that is run by systemic inequities. So the community, as April talked about, the community was not only students, but it was students, faculty, and staff. And we struggled together. I mean, and, and the beauty of it was the struggle. How, what is the, ins, uh, we, we call it, insection, what is it, insectionality? Uh, it, what is the relationship between the kind of experience all of us have in common? And, and, and based on that experience, how do we support each other? Uh, and needless to say, the curriculum is one piece, but who, who, who is responsible for the curriculum in terms of delivering it is another. So we had to deal with issues around hiring, faculty. Yes, we want very much to address the issues of the third world people. However, uh, we can't find any people that can teach it. 
So we spent time dealing with and struggling with DTFs and hiring practices and et cetera. So those are the kind of challenges that, 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 that we had to deal with back in the days. Yeah. And we even deal with them today. We'll get to that. <laughs> Could I just add something? So Tomas, I left around that time too. I was here on campus for two years and did individual contracts and worked on the World Bicentennial Forum. That was one of the things that I did. And because that support was not here, there was not a coordinated studies program that I was willing to be a part of. Um, was very fortunate to have York Wong. Some, so some of these are other faculty of color that were here back then truly supported students of color to do the work they wanted to do and to take it that next step. And, you know, it, and I look back, Elena and Tomas and I met last week and we talked about those early days. And when I think about what we did during that time, because it was a tremendous effort, it was a national conference that students put together, it was student generated for 1976, for the bicentennial, we had an alternative, oh, sorry, 74, yeah, for that alternative to the celebration, all coordinated with the support and direction of students and, and help from our faculty. So I, there were ways that we were able to cope and still learn and still move forward with what we wanted to do. So I think that's part of what happened as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Women of Color Unite, and again, a Washington statewide conference organized again by students. That was an effort with the support of faculty that we were able to put on. So there were ways while it was challenging that as a community, we had as students the ability to do those kinds of things above and beyond what you might be able to get in any other college. So at 19, here I was traveling up and down the West Coast, looking for people to come, uh, present, uh, trying to do fundraising. Uh, it was an experience that most <laughs> at that age would not be doing. So Evergreen has its pros and cons, and that was one way that I was able to cope with the challenges of being on campus. I think that would, Elena, do you want to so, add to that? Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, just kind of to add on to, to what um, Tomas Stone and, and April said, um, most, I, I actually can't think of any student that, any student of color that was here that wasn't a first generation college student. Yeah. Every one of us. Yeah. This was the first person in our family to go to college. So none of us came here with, oh, we know what to expect. None of us came here with having been exposed to how things would be in college. This was all a brand new thing for us. And we came in the middle, Evergreen, it's in the middle of nowhere. A thousand acres in the middle of nowhere. There was no bus service. If you didn't have a car, you were stuck on campus. And so for a people of color, this was a big shock. Um, one of the things that that was really helpful was the fact that it was students, faculty, and staff that worked together on things. It wasn't just students, it wasn't just faculty. And as April said, if you needed help, you could find somebody that would help you. It didn't matter whether that was their area of expertise, they could help you. They could help you get connections, they could help you find somebody that would work with you. If you have a, a problem, they would help you work through it. It really was a close-knit community that was kind of forced together by what was going on at the time. And it, it made a really big difference. And when April talks about the Third World Bicentennial Forum, she did go up and down the coast. We looked for anybody that we could find that we thought could contribute to this forum that would, the whole point was, people of color were here before Columbus, we're going to do the forum before the bicentennial. It's important to recognize that people of color were here. 
And it, there was a lot of work and a lot of effort that went into it, but it was successful because it was students, faculty, and staff. It was important to everybody, and everybody worked on it together. And people had the opportunity to do things they never would have expected to do in the past. It, they were opportunities for leadership that would not have existed any place else. And so it was a really big uh, opportunity for students and I think probably for faculty and staff. I, I mean, I can't speak for them, but I think it was an opportunity for them too to learn to work with students. And we had a, I, I feel like we had a great community because we did work together. And we could not have pulled it off had we not worked together. It was a big deal and it was successful because we could work together. Incidentally, I know we need to move on to other questions, but uh, uh, thinking about this event, uh, I, I went online to see what I could find about this event, and uh, there was nothing online. It was like a history had been erased. Third World Bicentennial Forum, uh, you Google it, it's not there. And uh, I just, uh, I think it's really important for an institution like this to preserve uh, its history, particularly some of the facets of its history that are as unique as uh, those major conferences that uh, April and others uh, helped put together, because I think they helped uh, put this college on the map in its earlier years. And I think that a prospective student of color uh, deserves the right to access that history mm -hmm. uh, if they're going to consider Evergreen as a place to study. Yeah, I wish you folks could have heard the collective sigh when they asked me if I knew about the bicentennial event, and I was like, no, and they're like, ah. Oh. So I agree, we need, to, we need to bring that history back. We need to celebrate it. So this next question is more for April, Eugene, and Ricardo. Um, that last question sort of covered the, the catalyst for the department, but I know that once something is formed and established, sort of continuing, um, to implement the vision and the mission can be challenging. So my next question were, um, what were some of the most successful ways that First Peoples during your tenure was able to further the mission? And then what were some initiatives that just like fell flat? They just didn't work. There were a lot of things that we did to to support students of color. And I don't know what still has continued since then. Um, but one of the things that I would do is an annual needs assessment and just ask, what do you want to do this year? What are your needs this year? What do you want to learn this year? And based upon that, would provide a series of workshops, many of them done by our own faculty of color, and a lot of coaching. So Tomas had talked earlier about that student coming to campus who does not know how to advocate for themselves. So we would have workshops on how do you do that. We would coach them on doing it. We would have them practice doing that. Otherwise, you will not have your needs met. So those are some of the things that we did. We had mid-quarter progress, I would call, I would call and email um, faculty and ask. How are students doing? Where are they at in their progress? Uh, and check on them. Um, early on, one of the things that I recognized is that there was a lack of support, counseling support in the counseling center for people of color. And one of the needs that did arise was to have someone on our own staff for that peer support piece. And, um, Again, student generated, no money. It began with a student in that very first peer support position. Um, Hisami Yoshida was our very first person in that position. And from there, when that occurred, the need became apparent. And, and that has grown and developed where I was able to have funding and have Eugene hired as that first person to do that position. So originally it was all students. Um, one effort that 
we also made was to mentor, have mentors for students, kind of a big brothers, big sisters idea. And to have a returning student mentor an incoming student of color. I, I don't know if any of that is still happening or not, um, but that was very successful. Um, another effort that I tried that I was not as successful was to have faculty of color be mentors. Um, and it didn't work out as well, I think, because we try to make it too formal. We were trying to match people based upon their career or degree interests. And that lasted, I think, only a year when um, the natural uh, uh, development of that relationship just didn't feel um, healthy anymore. It was just felt forced. And so that was one of our efforts that we, we thought would be a wonderful idea that kind of fell flat. One of, the, one of the challenges that I remember in terms of trying to match yeah. uh, faculty of color with students was, 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 was the formality, but it's also the, one of the things that the dynamic that was going on in the institution was that when you are trying to institutionalize change, the energy that you put into all of these different committees, and there were only a few of us here, and we were trying to cover all of these different kinds of DTFs and et cetera, that was an energy drain too. So the balance between trying to make institutional change and at the same time trying to serve students often became a stressful particular point. The, one of the things that we recognized in listening to students was that, well, first of all, the institution, the institution said, well, we want more students of color and we, 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 want, to, we want to support them. And so what we did was we developed an upward bound program. And that upward bound program was to, in fact, deal with and bring in more students of color. It was intended to, in fact, be a pipeline and, and when we heard students say, hey, we need some more support with regards to orientation and the support that's necessary to be successful in the uh, classroom, we wrote another grant. And that was called Special Services at that time. And so what we did was move from not only dealing with the, the kind of transition that needs to occur so that you can negotiate and navigate the system, but we start putting into place systems that would support what the institution said that they were all about, but there was also support for students when they came. First generation students need orientation. First generation students needed that kind of referral to all of the support services that were there. Students needed to know how to write. We said, okay, hey, we we'll put together the writing center. And so I moved from the director of Third World Coalition to the director of educational support programs, and we housed all of that together, administratively speaking, so that there would be smooth transition for students and also a smooth transition for us to do the kind of work. And, 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 and there's no doubt about it, it was social justice work. It was, it was work that was based upon understanding the need for a democratic cultural pluralism at this institution. And, and having that structure allowed us to serve students better and also to serve each other. So Eugene, Ricardo, did you expect, were those services still around when you were, during your tenure, did, did they work? Well, I, I was, uh, as, uh, when, in terms of this question about what was worked well, my, my recollection, um, Couple of thoughts. One is that uh, I thought what, one of the things we did well was to support <clears throat> and work with students who were in a certain students of color, a certain place in their in terms of their identity, their racial ethnic identity. That we're pretty good at that. I didn't think we did so well with students who were not in a particular place and doing the outreach, partly because we didn't have the the people power to do that. <clears throat> so I, I do remember that, and I, I was also thinking about the. 
I, I think a kind of a crucial decision. I was, you know, because I was relatively new, but there was this tension when April talked about um, the difficulty that the counseling center had serving students of color. I know I, I spent time there. I attended their meetings, spent half a day a week or something like that serving students to try to to, to try to do some institutionalization work of serving students of color. And I, I think it was marginally successful. Um, and, I, and I think there was a similar kind of a need in student activities as well. So when, and I may not remember, remember this correctly, so I can my colleagues to correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it was a key time when, when I was moving in that director role where there was a decision made to move from a, a coalition to an advising service. And the tension around that is, is, is pretty important, I think, for us to try to figure out and understand because uh, my recollection is it was a decision to go more toward the advising retention kind of focus and more away from the kind of uh, political uh, key kind of advocacy work that needed to happen to educate our student leaders about how you negotiate the institution, how you lead student clubs and organizations, <laughs> that we moved away from that. And, and I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't know the exact history about why we needed to decide that. Maybe it was a personnel issue, maybe it was an uh, institutional mission issue. I don't know. But I do think we lost a great deal there. I think that we did fairly well in, you know, in, in the advising of students. But... I, I remember the students of color who were student leaders in the organizations. I mean, they had a, some background because they had had a chance to work with April Stone Tomas, but as the, as the years went by, it became decreasingly uh, or increasingly difficult, I think, for them. And I remember having meetings with um, the folks in uh, student activities. And it's hard for, if you don't come with a, political consciousness about that work, about leading student organizations in a way that challenges the institution, that helps them understand how institutions work, that helps them see their institutional wide responsibility to, to bring multiculturalism to a campus. If you don't bring that as a staff member, it's pretty hard to build that. So, and so I remember having those conversations. They were difficult ones, and because I thought that those students were not getting what they needed, but it wasn't any in our mission any longer. So that's something I, I I have recollection of that I think was was difficult and somewhat tense at the time, and it felt like a key time in our history uh, of the service in the office. Uh, I came in when. First People's Advising Services, so it was already the advising sort of program and focus. But along with that was the peer mentoring, which was still alive at that point, and, and it made a real impact on the students who were here. I, I am mindful, uh, as we're talking, that, that um, through that part of the history, um, when I came on board, there were already two other programs that were not on this campus who were very successful at how to engage students, students of color in particular. Um, and, and it is, you know, one could say hindsight, um, as, as typical that this institution wasn't able to really look at the practices of the other uh, two campuses uh, at the time to see what was working and what was successful, right, to be able to apply that here. Um, so that, that sort of sight was lacking um, because this was such a predominantly white institution that students felt really isolated. Uh, not only in its location, but also in, in the culture of it. So the peer uh, support program that existed was intended to provide a lot of that support for the students to make it through. Um, I do recall that our students, regardless of the fact that there may not have been that intentional understanding of that dynamic uh, based on the changes, were still, because of the programs that you know, academic programs that existed were able to, to function in that way outside of, of that and then practice. Because I would say to you that one of the things that the student population here taught me was the difference between a warrior spirit, you know, and the peacemaker spirit uh, among students. Uh, and for me to be 
as, as the peacemaker that I am, uh, consummately, uh, to be in the presence of both was crucially important. Now, the students may not have seen it in those terms, but those were the terms in which they acted and, and moved within this institution. Uh, so the, the things that couldn't work uh, that I recall obviously were how to integrate the, the education with it to the, to the classroom experience. Because students oftentimes found themselves as being the only one or the one that were, uh, were, who were asked to speak on behalf of uh, that those kinds of dynamics were very much present and it, and it was hard, very difficult for, for them. And I think that that is still true probably today. So my question was always, why are we not thinking when we hire faculty, when we hire staff, to ask the questions that would help us as an institution at that time uh, to, to think about the skill level that we need in order to create a different kind of an environment. Um, so that was not working well because it was a student service oriented program. There was nothing that really supported a cultural shift within the institution to the level that it needed it. With the exception of programs such as Day of Absence, right? But it only happened once a year. So it wasn't enough to be able to create that kind of impact. Um, and that was one of the things that, that while I was here, uh, was expanded because of the support of staff and faculty um, to be able to uh, engage uh, the, our white counterparts to figure out ways of, of doing something during that day that really focused on self-learning around the issues. Uh, and I thought that that was helpful. Um, and while the five years that I was here, that was something that was created initially and, and developed throughout that five years so that, so that allies could come together to have those heavy conversations while day of absence, the folks of color would be able to, to you know, go away and, and be rejuvenated in a sense. Uh, so that was working very well. Again, I don't, I understand you're not having that this year, which is unfortunate, but anyway. Can, can I add one thing? Um, I, Ricardo made me think about this. Um, uh, I, I think that integration, if I understood you correctly, Ricardo, of the what was happening curricularly and co-curricularly, that's part of what I think my predecessors did so well with those students. They did really, really well at working with the faculty, working with the students, helping them understand kind of the, the, uh, <clears throat> the systemic nature of all the things that were happening and, and how it can work in the classroom, outside the classroom. <clears throat> I, uh, retro, looking back, I, I, I think may have, what, part of what may have happened, which is something that happened, is happening and has been happening quite a while nationwide in higher ed, is this accountability movement. That's really, uh, in my view, caused many, many problems. I mean, do we need more accountability? Yeah, in general, yes. But part of what I think has occurred is that we've gotten so numbers driven that we want to get as many students through as possible and institutions are generally uh, <coughs> funded as a result of it. And part of the result of that is that we are more <coughs> paying attention to those numbers than we are to the kinds of uh, integration of curricular, co-curricular that was happening before. So, <coughs> so. I mean, there's always these issues about student leaders perhaps not doing their academics and all that stuff, but that's resolvable stuff. When those students are that engaged, I think we can figure out ways to help them through. The problem is when we take that away and just want them to perform in the classroom and we don't develop the leadership skills, the coalition building skills, the way how you work together to, to make organizational institutional change. When we take that away, everybody loses, I think, including uh, large segments of our uh, uh, of our institutions and our society, and so that that's my concern. That not just here, but nationwide, we have headed in that direction. And and I I'm hoping Evergreen can start pulling back on that and starting to provide some leadership in the other direction of um, <clears throat> what does it mean now to provide leadership for young, vital student leaders who we know have the capacity to be able to lead in really important ways. So that brings me to my next question, which could be for Holly uh, and Ricardo. Um, 
But I'm thinking Holly because, like I said, I arrived in 2002, and we were one year out from 9-11. Most of my uh, students I graduated with you either went to college or you went off to war, and it felt like very trying times. And I'm just wondering, supporting marginalized students during times of political uncertainty um, is a critical part of the work that we do, uh, not just in student affairs, but in higher education. Um, and I'm wondering what were the challenging political moments during your tenure, and I want you to answer first, but I want to open it up because this is nothing new. I know that you know what I got here is like, this is so unique, and I come back later and I see students and they're like, this is so unique. Um, so Holly, I'm wondering how you supported students during that challenging time, and then maybe opening up to other folks, if you were during, if during your tenure you felt like there was a big need to support students in understanding the political context outside of Evergreen. Thanks, Candy. Um, so Candy talked about when she first arrived at Evergreen, it was as a First People's, first people's Scholar, which was our pre-orientation program. And the year before, in 2001, to Candy arriving, the first day of the Scholars Program was September 11th. Um, and I got up that morning and was getting ready and was excited and anticipating that we had this group of new students coming. Um, and I am my mother's daughter. I get all gooey at the beginning of the school year and thinking about the excitement of these new students that are coming and the excitement that they have and the anticipation and the nervousness. And I was in that space, and as we all know, what happened that morning as the airplanes went into the buildings, um, the Twin Towers, and coming to campus and trying to figure out what are we going to do, and we were getting phone calls from students, are, are you going to have the scholars program? What's going to happen? Um, we had a student who was coming from Minneapolis, and his mom was on the phone with me as she's saying, well, the planes have been grounded, and trying to figure out what was going to happen. And Carlton got on the Greyhound bus, um, because he wanted to get here. He wasn't certain when the airports were going to open up again. Um, and so he got on the Greyhound, and his mom and I were in communication as he was journeying across the country, and she was concerned about how he would get from the Greyhound station to campus. Um, and I'm like, we'll meet him. We'll, we'll meet him. But in the midst of that, it felt very important um, to kind of create a sense of grounding and normalcy, and that we needed to in some ways, the show needed to go on. We needed to go ahead and run with the First People Scholars Program because we had a commitment. This was the beginning of this cohort of students' college experience. This was the beginning of their evergreen experience. And this was now part of their story, but it didn't need to define that experience. And so really, it was just that piece of trying to, to be grounded and keep focused on the aspect of why they were here and what our work was for that pre-orientation program and the scholars program and building the community, helping the students get to know the campus, get to know the broader Olympia community, which they were part of. And while this awareness of all this uncertainty around us, but still kind of forging ahead. Um, and I really think that that defined the work that we did during the six, seven years that I spent with First Peoples of, um, First Peoples Advising Services was really about advising. It was about supporting our students to getting their education, um, whatever that educational goal may be and whatever it was that they needed. I remember I worked with Phyllis Lane, the Dean of Students at the time, and Phyllis always would say, just like, we just have to meet the students and support them where they are. They've been admitted, they're here, and we do the work that we have to do to get them through. And so really, it was that advising component and piece that really drove our work. And part of it was around creating community that came through the scholars program, that came through supporting and working in a partnership with the different student groups and organizations. Um, and it's, for me, it's a fabulous opportunity to be back in this space. I'm reminded very much of the end of the year gathering that we would have here with the First Peoples um, graduation celebration and this wonderful opportunity to come together with students and their families and friends and their support network and celebrate those who were the first in their family to graduate and the significance that that meant and the joy and pride that was there. And so to be able to, to be here and support them through that advising journey and through that educational piece um, was good work. Yeah, I would echo that. It's that community building. And Evergreen has the capacity and it does that well, I think. Or at least it makes that room and space. Um, what I'm reminded of, in the five years that I was here, I would look at um, the retention rate 
of our students of color, um, specifically the Olympia campus specifically. And the, for their first year experience from first year, you know, to the, to the, from fall to fall. And our students of color had higher retention rate, which I always found, except for one, one year we kind of dipped a little bit and I couldn't figure out why that was. Um, but it had a higher retention rate than our, their white uh, counterparts. And, um, and I thought about it and, I'm, you know, I, I, and I still reflect on the reality that part of, of what I think made that happen was this, you know, there was nowhere to go and so you have to build community. And unlike any other institution, this place allowed for our students of color to find their voice, to be able to be bold, to speak up in the classroom, to argue points, to come together and have discussions. That sense of community, I think, is what made a difference. That even though I would hear students say, this is a horrible place because you know, of what's going on around racism, um, they were able to say it. <laughs> and that made a huge difference for them. And so that community building definitely, I think, was uh, important for the success of those students. Would anybody else like to add to that? It's not that I don't no, want to be. No, what are you doing? It, Where are you at? I, it's not that I don't Jumped want to be the with the people. <laughs> uh, it, my hearing is such that I can hear better. Okay. Down here, it's muffled up there. You do you. Yeah, I, on, I only have thirty percent. <laughs> I only have seventy percent of my hearing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearing challenged, so it has nothing to do with you all. And my, yeah. Okay. I wanted. I wanted to be clear with with the group. Also, you know, it's not that I'm separating myself. I get right? it. I get it. Now, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'm going to move to the next. Co I think. Yeah, I, on, so I want to go back really quick to the day of absence uh, and day of presence that was mentioned earlier. So this will be the first year in many years uh, that we won't be hosting the day of absence. Um, and I'm just curious from the panelists what the day of absence has meant to our campus in the past and what does the abs day of absence mean potentially to our future? Can I feel that? Yeah. I'd, I'd like to feel it because historically speaking, the day of absence came early on and it has over time it, it, the day of absence, when it was first conceived and implemented within the third world slash first peoples. And did, did we talk about how it moved from third world to first peoples? Yeah, okay. So the people will understand what happened is when we started the Third World Coalition, we were operating on the principle of global consolidation. And not about 19, was it 78, 79, when we had a day of absence, students said, and some of the staff and faculty said, we don't want to be called third world anymore because third world connotes underdevelopment. What we want to be called is first people because it connotes the indigenous nature of us as a people. We are first people. So we struggle with it and, and, and it was not, it was not, okay, it was great debate. And this went down at Day of Absence. It, this was happening at the Day of Absence. Yeah. And it was great debate. And that was what was beautiful about the community building. It was not like you put an idea out there and everybody said, yes, okay, that's fine. No, it was great debate. And the debate was such that people who wanted to be first people made a very good argument and it became first people. But the day of absence was conceived, and, and I, I have to credit Dr. Maxine Mims and Dr. Joy Hardeman came up to the office one day and said, you know what? 
These people are not listening to us. Let's do like the, the play. Let's have a day of absence where we go off campus, we build community, and we do strategic planning. It was not a day in which the college paid for anything. We, as faculty and staff, we put money in the hat, bought food, students brought pop, oh, excuse me, soda water, <laughs> excuse me, carbonated drinks, and napkins and the plates and et cetera. And we had, a, we had a potluck. And we fed each other. We talked about what issues the institution, and we, we look back at the, the non-white DTF. And for you all's information, the first year I came to the Evergreen State College as an administrator, the third world community, the, the first people's community, decided that we were going to filed a class action suit against the Evergreen State College because of the fact that Evergreen was not being responsive and not being accountable for the results of the non-white DTF. I came in as an administrator, and I'm saying, oh my goodness. <laughs> and it was expected that everybody was going to sign this class action suit. And so my name was the first name on the class action suit. And Carmody asked me, do you know what you just did? You're an administrator. You're supposed to be representing the institution. I said, no. I was hired to represent the people of color. So that's why my name is on there. And I was thinking, well, maybe I need to look for a job. <laughs> But I stayed here for eight, eight nine years. But so the, the intent of the day of absence was to look at how do we strategically plan and deal with the institution. It was not an, it was not an institutional. And, and we just said, based upon what the play did, we just said there won't be any people of color on campus. And we didn't, we didn't, we didn't ask for permission. We just left, just like a day of absence. And we came back, and that was our annual plan for the next year, whatever we decided at the day of absence. Now, you ask the other side of the question is, what did it do for us in the past? It allowed us the opportunity to build community. It allows us the opportunity to go through self-healing, because when you're struggling all the time, in the belly of the monster. You need some time in which you reflect and rejuvenate yourself. And it gave us the opportunity to strategically plan. So did it always feel like that to other folks? Was it a time of rejuvenation? Uh, when I, during my tenure, that was part of sort of the, the purpose is to go and rejuvenate. Yeah. Um, so it did feel very much that that was what was happening. Uh, and the energy that, that came along with that out, out or off campus was definitely present. So that was pretty constant. Uh, Douglas Turner Ward, by the way, the, uh, the author of the, of the short play, Day of Absence, um, we would play it on the radio here. We would, well, sort of, we read it, <laughs> pretend that we were acting it out. Um, but yes, I, th I thought it was very much that. I, by the time I came on board, it was a, a bit more institutionalized, meaning that mm -hmm. it was expected that it would happen. Um, and the president's office also supported that it made sure that it happened um, as well. Uh, we started doing all kinds of good posters and all kinds of different things. Um, we're bringing in people to do some work with the folks who remained on campus, and we invited folks when we went off campus to help us do that rejuvenation. So it was, I thought, a very powerful statement to make, and it definitely was an important one to make uh, even then. I think another piece, aside from the reju rejuvenation, was an opportunity to really to build community. Um, 
being in First Peoples, we really had an opportunity to get to know the students of color fairly well, but there were many faculty and staff of color across campus that didn't have that opportunity. And the day of absence was the opportunity for us to gather off campus together and for the students to be able to see, here's your network. This, these folks are here supporting you and will help get you through to crossing graduation stage on Red Square even though you may not see them every day and you may not know that they exist, they're the folks that will call in the registrar's office and say, hey, what's going on with so-and-so's registration or what's up with their financial aid? And so it was an opportunity for them to be able to begin to see and understand what that full network looked like at the college of who the other faculty and staff of color were. Um, oftentimes students, because they would break for lunch or what have you within their program at the exact same time, they didn't get to see other students of color or other faculty of color, other staff of color. And day of absence was that time that they realized, oh, this is the rest of our community that we haven't and we don't see on a regular daily basis. So I think that was another big piece of the, of the community building and rejuvenation. I think that speaks to the change that Eugene had brought up earlier. When we were students here, that wasn't an issue. We were a community. We met on and off campus on a regular basis. There was no need to have something formal established. We did that already. Um, and when we did with the day of absence, when Joy and Maxine had brought that idea forward. We hadn't been going off campus already. We'd been meeting, even if it was informally, with faculty and staff. It was when they brought that idea forward, we went, that's a great idea. Let's call it that. And let's formalize that and move it forward in that direction. Because at that point, it was part of advising services moving in that direction. There was less of an opportunity for some of that to occur. So those first times that we met off campus, they sometimes were at people's houses. Whoever was willing to host it, that's where we would go. And it was potluck. It was chip in some money and you know what are we gonna where are we gonna eat and where are we gonna go next time. Right, right? Yeah. yeah. Hey, April, you remember, you remember, it's just, the first time we had the day of absence, it was at the organic farm. Right, yeah. And we had to move it from there because <laughs> we had a luau and we dug a hole and put the pig in there and everything and did Steve and Peel and all of them did. And we we couldn't go back to the organic farm because we polluted the ground <laughs> with the pig. <laughs> so we, we, we went to people's houses and we went up to Tacoma we, campus. Yeah, we did, we're at Tacoma. Yeah, and so it, it was, it was a, a moving, it was a, it was a, a, a moving kind of a festival. You know, for that that question about what does it mean, from my view, it, I think it's a huge loss. It's a huge loss, for some of the reasons that people are saying here. I mean, when obvious, I think obviously that because there's less of that kind of community building activity going on, it's even more important for the people of color on campus. And when you talk about the the key, I think, responsibility of the First Peoples area to, to do um, campus-wide kind of development on this issue. I mean, clearly to me, from what happened last year, it's really needed, right? It, when it pushes that many buttons and it goes in a crazy haywire like that, something is it's pushing buttons that are very, very important to understand. And I mean, we could talk a lot about that, but um, to me, I think it's a big, big loss to I hope it just doesn't go away and never revisit it because it's uh, it's just a crucial event that has so much ongoing capacity to develop uh, the community, I think, as a whole, the whole campus community. 
I think it's an opportunity to rethink what that should look like going forward. So who says you can't go off campus? Who says you can't meet? Why do you need to call it day of absence? Maybe it's time to rename that. What do students want? What does the community need? So this is the ideal time to really reflect. Honestly, from way back in the day, mm -hmm. when we started doing these, right? Mm -hmm. In the late 70s and 80s, I was surprised that it was still going on. I thought, haven't they come up with something new yet? <laughs> hasn't, it, hasn't it grown and evolved as many times as we changed the name of that office? Why are they still using the same name? I mean, you know, really need to think strategically. How do you want to identify? Who do you want to be? What students are here? What are the needs of the community now? Okay? And evolve. I want to piggyback on that, April. And, 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 and Eugene, I, I, I agree with you in principle. The issues around social justice won't go away. And people who are interested in working on issues around social justice and democratic cultural pluralism, they will figure out, they will figure out another way in which that kind of work will go on and those kinds of issues will in fact be addressed. It is an, it is an institution-wide issue. So perhaps whatever evol evolves out of what Dr. Chastity uh, Douglas will be doing in terms of looking at other ways in which we can address that institutional issue, uh, I, I'm sure people will continue to be involved in it. The symbolism that exists in, in terms of the evolution of uh, the day of absence, it changed anyway. It moved from what it was intended to be to an institutional movement that in fact um, per perhaps lived out its time mm -hmm. as it existed but the issues around social justice and the issues around democratic cultural pluralism will still be addressed. I love that. I'm gonna also allow Elena to chime in on this one I, too. I was just going to suggest that it, it seems like there's probably still a need for people to get together and talk about issues and talk about how to work together. My suggestion is that because things have changed so much at Evergreen in the last 40 some years that um, Evergreen consider um, involving community members, involving people that are not necessarily directly involved in the college because I think it's important for students to get a connection with other people of color, people of color that are successful. They can see, they can, they can find people that they can that can be mentors. They can find people that can that can help them work their way through whatever issues there are. And I can tell you, 40 some years ago, that was not an option. There weren't, there just weren't people of color. Like, not that there's a whole lot now, but it's a whole lot different community now um, than it used to be. It's probably only been maybe 20 years since an African American could buy a house in Tumwater. This has been a very racist community in the past. It's changed. It hasn't changed a lot, but it's changed. And I think it would be helpful for students to be able to work with people in the community and see there's more out there. I, I'm not totally dependent on strictly what Evergreen can offer me. I, I think I'd add, to, I think it's a great idea, and I'd add to community organizations of color that connection, I think, is really key as well. And, and I don't know what the community looks like now that way, but tribal communities, whatever's out there, that connection between here and out in the community is key, I think. I've got a question, and I'm wondering if we can start with Tomas. But I'm wondering what lessons have you taken away from First Peoples? I'm sorry? What lessons have you taken away from your time with First Peoples that maybe you implemented into your other professional work, into your life? Uh, I think the thing that I took most 
with me from that experience was a way of thinking about the academy as an organic entity uh, that had to be uh, dealt with as such uh, because it's made up of people uh, and it's made up of people who uh, are applying their worldviews to the maintenance of that organism and uh, if the makeup of the people who are sustaining that organism is static over time, you can expect the organism to remain stat static over time as well. Um, but also that uh, those of us who uh, view ourselves as outside of that organism and attempting to figure out how to utilize it uh, for our own purposes uh, to advance ourselves individually, our families, and our communities uh, have to always be thinking about what strategies we apply. This is why uh, it is important to have the opportunity to dialogue outside of, uh, as my brother Stone puts it, the belly of the beast. If we don't step outside of this from time to time to think about and to share with one another our perceptions about what is going on inside, we overlook uh, key needs that need to be addressed and key opportunities to address those needs. Uh, I think the one stable connection that I've seen over time to communities of color uh, has not been a connection between the Olympia uh, campus and the community. It's been the Tacoma campus uh, and its surrounding community. That's the one real truth that I've seen uh, in the connection between the Evergreen State College as an organic uh, organism and the surrounding communities, especially the communities of color. Holly? Okay. The things that I reflect from my tenure here are one, the lack of silos when it came to working with faculty and student services to provide whether it was participating and collaborating in programs to help you know to to build community for our students of color um, that to me I've, I've not seen that level of working together um, and it was also very true when i went up to the tacoma camp especially but also here on this campus um, that ability to really be part of, as a student services person, to be part of instruction in supporting our students was, to me, very, very impressive. Um, and, and I think of that oftentimes as a model uh, to emulate where, wherever I go, if it's possible, right? Um, and the other piece that I do take, in, um, and that is day of absence uh, itself. I mean, I reflect on that. Uh, where can you go in an institution where something of that, a program like that can happen, where people really get to get together and, and disappear, and that the institution has no real choice but to allow it to happen. Uh, or that's the wrong terminology. <laughs> but to see it happen, let me fr reframe that, but to see it happen uh, and to choose to participate uh, in a way that, that um, they may not have otherwise. Um, and then the third thing is, how powerful the voice of students, um, in spite of their sense of oppression that they felt, could still be. Uh, that, above all, is like they spoke their mind. They were able to speak, find who they were, figure it out in the midst of, of, of it all. Yeah. Looking at you, Eugene. Okay. Uh, a couple of things. One, one is, uh, I think, I think, again, wanting to echo what Elena and Tomas said about community, because I, I spent many years and on multiple campuses and a lot of time and energy trying to figure out institutional change toward diversity. <clears throat> and I think I've reached the conclusion that one of the most effective ways is this community connection, because, and we do it on our campus now, that when we, it's, you know, institutional change in these 
crazy higher ed organizations is very, very difficult. But when, you, when we work with the community and we come face to face every day with the face of the community, we have to do stuff differently. We just have to. Right? That's what the Tacoma campus, I think, has probably been trying to teach folks for a long time. But, um, <clears throat> but it took me a long, a long I'm a little slow. So. But I really do think that that's um, something that's very fundamental to trying to make change institutionally to keep that connection or develop those connections. And the second thing, you know, relates to, I think, what, Ricardo, you were saying about the student voice, that how important that is. And so um, I was really struck. Um, I mean, I wasn't here when all the, the, all the activism was happening last year. Um, but I was, I'm, I'm aware of a couple things. One, after talking with a few folks, is, is how poorly, of course, the media reported on that event, that so many pieces were missing that that drives a lot of problems, <clears throat> and um, how important it is when there is activism like that to work together as a community to figure out how to control the message in a way. And in social media these days, it's very difficult to do, but we, you have to figure that out, because otherwise, it goes haywire and you I mean, what's out there right now, I was looking last night on it, is it's about this much probably what really happened. And most of it is, 90% is really negative toward this institution, which I'm, I know is not the real picture out there, but that's what's out there. So being strategic, I think, about um, when there are key events happening, providing context to what's happened, um, helping students understand, as well as the rest of the community, how you strategically um, impact change around these key events like that is really, really important. And I think so that strategic thinking that can happen with a collective is something that, um, I don't know, maybe it was happening last year, my impression is maybe there was some lacking of that that would be really useful, and most campuses aren't doing it either, so, um, so that's my other thought. Thank you. Uh, Eugene brings up the unfortunate coverage of the more recent day of absence. And uh, it reminds me of a conversation we were having earlier during the reception uh, when Elena shared something uh, that uh, I hadn't occurred to me, and that was that. Uh, uh, there was a, a code of conduct in the earlier years of this institution. And uh, Elena was reminding us of that. And, uh, you know, what it really meant was that uh, uh, in situations where a member of the community was acting in a way that was harmful to other members of the community, that uh, their colleagues could police them, whether it was students policing one another, faculty policing one another, uh, there did seem to be um, a cohesiveness uh, to the institution in its earlier years, even though it was not effectively serving everyone. Um, and I think that that lends itself to the kind of unfortunate coverage that uh, we see today. Um, I'm also reminded that, you know, when, and we referred to this several times during this conversation, about uh, how white the institution uh, has been during its history. Uh, it certainly was very white when, uh, when we arrived. And uh, one thing that we did notice was that there was a significant number of well-to-do white students from the East Coast. Um, you wouldn't know at first glance that they were well-to-do because of their lifestyle choices. Um, and we we uh, coined an, un an unkind uh, phrase to refer to them. Uh, we called them trust fund hippies uh, because they were uh, running away from their parents' money. But you know, when you spend enough time in the college community and you spend enough time interacting with them, you'd find that there were areas where we had common cause in our opposition to war, for example, in our opposition to uh, irrational exploitation of resources, uh, things like that. There were areas where we struggled to find common cause, but 
uh, as long as there was that kind of a cohesiveness in the community where uh, we could pull one another up short and say, hey, what's going on? Uh, you wouldn't see things like that happening. The, the early struggles of the college were to defend itself against uh, the impulse in the legislature that never seems to want to go away of, of legislators who want to defund the college. That was always there and it will always be here. But, uh, uh, you know, what's different today in, in today's day and age is that we now have a corporate world that uh, through... Uh, the rubric of uh, educational reform is trying to uh, tear down uh, public education in all of its forms uh, so that it can be privatized. And uh, with that uh, comes hand in hand a shift of perception about education as a public good toward that of a private good. And so what is intended to be left for the rest of us is uh, some form of training, however rudimentary or however uh, complex that might be, uh, whereas uh, education is perceived as a privilege of the elite. Uh, this institution has seemed to ha enjoy some sort of uh, immunity from that uh, reform movement, but uh, I guess I'm, I'm feeling increasingly that uh, that uh, immunity could be short-lived, and I think this community would do well uh, not to dwell in its past, uh, but to look toward its future. And I would like to think that uh, creating community is an increasingly important part of the future of this institution. And if that means including people of color, it has to mean uh, supporting efforts by and of and for people of color uh, for self-determination. I love it. We're also close to the end of our time, so this, I'm opening it up to any final thoughts to leave our evergreen community with, words of wisdom. When I think back on my time in First Peoples, and I think because I have stayed at Evergreen, I've been part of the community after leaving the director role, um, I'm reminded about the nature of education as being transformative, and that many of our students are here to transform their lives, to transform their community. Um, and it's a real honor and privilege to be able to be with them and work alongside them in that work. And as we're sitting here now and thinking about and looking to the future of Evergreen, um, I think for me it's that important piece to hold on to, it's that transformative nature and that we need to partner with our students, um, with our students of color to kind of live out what what that is that their goal is to accomplish. Let me just add that there are a lot of alums of color right here in Olympia. Right, Elena? Right. <laughs> and we are available. We just need to be asked. We have faculty emeriti here if asked, I'm sure they would attend and participate as well. We have a lot of history and a lot of support from those of us that have been here early and have stayed. So if there is an interest in developing that community on and off campus, all you have to do is put the call out and I think it would happen. You're looking at me. Yeah. What you want? <laughs> the future. You got some final words for us? Closing thoughts? Yeah. Well, let me let me let me say that it has it has been first of all an honor to be to share the panel with all of the people that have had something to do with the First Peoples uh, services, um, whether it was the coalition or the advising services. The most rewarding thing for me about working at Evergreen and working with Evergreen even now is, is the sense of possibility the sense of knowing that we have the capacity to 
do the things that are necessary to work at finding ways in which we can help students develop the skills, the temperament, whatever else, that are necessary to deal with the whole issue of social justice. Now, we're challenged as an institution to look at ways in which that can be formally done. The event, and everybody talks about the event of May 17, 2017, and we have the opportunity as a learning organization to look at that and ask the question, what is it that we can do differently that will, in essence, nurture the spirit of our students, our faculty and our staff, that will facilitate the kind of energy that comes with the issues around social justice and that will, in essence, create the kind of synergy that's necessary for the institution to address the issues that exist within the organization that still have remnants of systemic inequalities or inequities and deal with that in a holistic way that involves students in the process of doing that. And perhaps, just perhaps, we won't have to look at the media misinterpreting what in fact our students did last spring. Matter of fact, if we did that, we would take into account the history of this institution and look at the possibilities that still exist for us to move forward. The most rewarding thing in working with the third world community, the first people's community, that I can take away is that I know that through struggle, there's unity. And that through unity, we are capable as a people to deal with any, any kind of obstacle that is created because of the fact that people, there are groups of people or a group of people that do not believe that this earth should be shared. Okay. So I was fortunate enough to have a lot of willing people join a panel and talk about an organization that I hold dear. Um, there were uh, a couple voices that couldn't join us tonight and directors that I do want to acknowledge, which is Eddie Maeva, who sends us hello, uh, Rashida Love, uh, Normalicia Pino, um, who also contributed to this great legacy. I think also missing uh, from the stage and from the event is Raquel Salinas. And I actually want to end the event with her words. So sorry I missed this amazing reunion. Having had a chance to work with all of these folks, I am reminded of the hard work the faculty, staff, and students have shared over the years to create a vision of unity, equity, respect, and love. How do we help each other live up to our own ideals? How do we work through our own origin stories, so to speak, to become our best possible selves in a world that still averts its gaze at our, at our issues of history, identity, and pain? I believe the answer lies in education, in sharing who we are, and that is what First Peoples has always stood for, for me anyways. A million thank yous and much love. Raquel. Thank you for coming. Have a great evening.